Well, it's the top of the hour, <clears throat> and we do still have plenty of people joining, but I think in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and get started for today. This is the North Central Climate Collaborative Every Other Month webinar, and um, by way of logistics, this meeting is being recorded. We do not have the ability to unmute ourselves, so if you have any questions as we go along, go ahead and post those in the chat. I'll be looking through and we will get those answered in the order they are submitted at the end of the talk. We are delighted today to have with us Zach Leeser, who is a new state climatologist for the great state of Missouri. And without further introduction, I'll turn it over to Zach to let us know what he'd like to present today. Great, thank you, Hans. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. And um, yeah, I'd like to start by saying that I, I really appreciate Hans and the North Central Climate Collaborative uh, Group for inviting me to, to speak today. I'm, I'm really excited to talk a little bit about my research. And also I'll talk a little bit about my new position at the University of Missouri and uh, how I hope to integrate some of my research into um, some extension and climate service activities here in the state of Missouri. Um, so my name is Zach Leeser. I started at the University of Missouri on August 1st as an assistant professor in the School of Natural Resources. Um, in there, I, I work primarily with the M Missouri Climate Center, um, but I also have an appointment with the University of Missouri Extension where I'll be serving as the Missouri State Climatologist. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here today and talk about my research. Um, the title of this talk is Utilizing Hydroclimatic Data to Improve Drought Monitoring and Seasonal Forecasting Techniques. Uh, really quickly, I would like to make an, an acknowledgement. Before coming to Missouri, I spent time as a, a graduate student and a postdoc at The Ohio State University. And so a lot of the research I'll share today uh, was done there, and I'd really like to uh, acknowledge my former advisor, Stephen Quiring, as well as our research group there, the Climate Analytics Lab. There'd be too many to list, uh, past and present there, but um, all of my colleagues, uh, it was really a collaborative effort for some of this research, and I really appreciate uh, their help and friendship along the way. Um, so just to, to start here, I'd like to actually talk about uh, hydroclimatology and what is hydroclimatology. So I often refer to myself as a hydroclimatologist and sometimes I actually get this question. And so uh, there's two definitions that might be a little bit dated, but I really like them. And I think that they're still applicable today uh, to define hydroclimatology. Uh, the first back in, in 1967, this might've been maybe the first definition defines hydroclimatology as the study of the influence of climate upon waters of the land. Um, then 20 years later, we get a similar definition as an approach to studying hydrologic events within the climatological context. Now, these definitions are both a little different in how they frame uh, what hydroclimatology it is, but I think really what they do a good job of is uh, kind of showing that we're not just looking at the atmospheric component of the system when we're thinking about weather and climate, um, but how that information impacts other systems, particularly the hydrologic system as well. And so uh, here you'll notice I've got some news stories here that I'm showing on the right that kind of give an idea of, of how we'll look at some uh, climatic events, but within a larger system-based approach in hydroclimatology. And so we look at things like the flooding in Houston from Hurricane Harvey, uh, drought impacts on, on ecological systems as well. Uh, and these are all kind of examples of what I would refer to as hydroclimatic hazards. And these hazards typically have a lot of different impacts on human and environmental systems. So when we think about things like floods and droughts here, uh, those impacts can span from uh, sectors including agriculture, energy, uh, ecology, water resources, human health, and the economy. And they can be really wide ranging impacts as well. Um, so we see uh, these hydroclimatic hazards, droughts and floods, uh, really uh, making a significant impact on weather disasters in the US and globally as well. Uh, so these kind of stacked bar charts that I'm showing here are from uh, the National Center for Environmental Information. 
their US billion dollar weather and climate disasters. So uh, going back to 1980 uh, through last year in 2022, we can see these disasters. And so on the left, we see all of the different types of billion dollar disasters. And we can see that there's clearly a trend with them as they've been increasing through time. Now, these figures have been adjusted for inflation, um, but we know changes in climate variability as well as changes to vulnerability to these hazards have increased the number of billion dollar climate disasters. But what I think is interesting about this figure is that if you look along the bottom of the bar charts, uh, you see a lot of this uh, kind of brownish color as well as the blue bars, which represent those droughts and floods. And they're really a persistent baseline in that almost every year, there's at least one of these billion dollar uh, droughts or flood events. And so they're a really persistent climate hazard and costly as well. And so on the right, I've just broken out using their data, uh, the droughts and floods only, and that shows this a little bit better, um, that we have at least one uh, significant drought or flood each year. And so uh, really relevant hazards to, to monitor. And so I wanna zoom in a little bit on Missouri, since that's where I'm working now, and, and see what the prevalence of these drought and flooding disasters are across the state. And so here uh, we look at the, the same billion dollar events, but in a, a table format here and just for this, the state of Missouri. And so we can see uh, roughly 23% and 31% of the total costs going back to 1980 from these disasters has uh, been attributed to drought and flooding. Uh, so, so roughly 20 billion uh, out of a total possible 50 billion has been due to the drought and flooding events. So we can see that Missouri is definitely vulnerable and susceptible to these hydroclimatic hazards. Um, and it's really easy to look around the state and find lots of examples, uh, both recent and historical. Uh, so here's a very, very recent uh, example here from uh, Bollinger County in southeastern Missouri. And so there was actually several different heavy rainfall events that you might have seen in the news earlier this month. Uh, on the left here, I'll show one of the earlier rainfall events. So this actually occurred on August 4th. And I've got the county circled here, uh, 8 to 10 inches of rainfall in a short period. Uh, we can see here a, a picture of the town of Marble Hill, Missouri, uh, where that flooding was going through what looks like kind of a, a, a populated area as well. And so here we see a, a really a strong flooding event. But what's interesting is, is it's there's a bit of juxtaposition uh, against the background of drought. And so we can see here uh, the most recent US drought monitor map uh, from last Thursday. And a lot of the state is covered in drought conditions with, with some severe and extreme drought as well. Now, Bollinger County is uh, drought free now after those recent rains, um, but, it, but it, you only have to go back to July to really find drought conditions in that area. And so on the right, I, I've pulled some uh, pictures from the Seymour report system for that county in July 2023. We see dry pastures, uh, brown grass, no, no moisture in this area just a month earlier. Um, so here's just one really local example of these hydroclimatic extremes and flips between really dry periods and wet periods and the hazards that they can pose uh, here in Missouri. So as a, as a hydroclimatologist, I am excited to be here in Missouri uh, to focus on, on some of these extremes and, and link my research with some of the more operational weather and climate activities in the state. And so briefly, I wanna introduce um, some of my research areas. And so uh, as a hydroclimatologist, I like to combine atmospheric and terrestrial data. So not just thinking about west weather and climate data, but some of that terrestrial data thinking about things like soil moisture, uh, fluxes at the land surface, uh, stream flow as well, and, and looking at how those uh, two streams of data really can connect and, and influence each other. Uh, in doing so, this gives us a chance to better understand and, and quantify even land atmosphere interactions uh, by really analyzing both, both forms of data, atmospheric and terrestrial. And so by better understanding land atmosphere interactions, uh, I like to apply this in my research to two main areas, uh, the first being improvements to climate prediction. Uh, and so I'll talk about these a little bit today, uh, but the first being the persistence of hydroclimatic extremes. So persistent wet and dry periods and, and using these in forecasting techniques uh, and looking at forecasting on subseasonal to seasonal timescales. And so these S2S timescales I'll reference today 
Um, we're thinking really anywhere beyond two weeks when some of those traditionally used numerical weather prediction models really start to break down, uh, lose their predictive skill out to one season. So that two weeks to three months period falls squarely in that S2S timescale. Um, I also like applying this research to improvements and drought monitoring. Uh, so today I'll talk a little bit about drought severity classification and uncertainty in drought monitoring as well. Um, but I wanna start and, and talk about the persistence of hydroclimatic extremes because I think this also really applies to um, drought. And, and we typically think about uh, droughts tending to persist for a period of time as well. And a big part of this is, is that the land surface plays a role in hydroclimatic hazards and extreme heat as well, particularly during the warm season. Um, so we think about land atmosphere feedbacks and we really like to focus on them more in the warm season because this can serve as a source of memory. And so constructing a lot of, of these seasonal forecasts, for example, we may think about teleconnections. Uh, there's a lot in the news right now about El Nino Southern Oscillation and more ocean atmosphere interactions. And these are very, very important for seasonal predictions. But during the summer months, uh, when, when these teleconnections might have an impact on circulation patterns in the jet stream, uh, the jet stream is usually far to the north in the US. Um, and instead of getting large weather systems like mid-latitude cyclones that are bringing our precipitation, a lot of the summertime rainfall is actually more localized convective type of rainfall. And so in this case, uh, some of those larger scale teleconnections aren't as important in these seasonal predictions, uh, but more local scale couplings such as land atmosphere feedbacks are. And so uh, you might hear terms such as land surface memory that really describe a slow evolution of the land surface relative to the atmosphere. And as we see a slower evolution of the land surface, this can be used uh, to predict some of those higher frequency variabilities back into the atmosphere. And so just a quick schematic that I think shows an example of this on the right here uh, of what would be a positive land atmosphere feedback cycle. And so if we were to think about an initial warm temperature anomaly, maybe warmer than normal temperatures, what does this lead to? So this first leads to higher atmospheric demand for water, and we would see higher potential evapotranspiration. Now, if that water was available uh, to the atmosphere, we would then see uh, evapotranspiration occurring and we'd see a drying of soil moisture. And, and we'd really watch those soil moisture measurements and, and see those decrease in response to the increased evapotranspiration. Now, when this happens and the land surface loses water, this can actually change um, some of the energy fluxes at the surface. So uh, after a while that ET has been occurring and, and there hasn't been as much rainfall to replace this, we can see uh, lower latent heat fluxes when there's less ET occurring uh, and less evaporation and more sensible heat fluxes, which actually makes it easier to heat the near surface atmosphere and the land surface uh, because we lower the specific heat. So then we actually get a hotter surface and, and go back to the top of our chart here. So we started with a warm temperature and actually made that even warmer uh, based on that positive land atmosphere feedback cycle. And so by understanding some of this land surface flux and, and understanding uh, the feedbacks, this can help uh, us and give us a source of subseasonal to seasonal forecast skill. Um, so here I, I show a, a quick figure from a paper that was done about five years ago. And what we constructed is based on uh, understanding the importance of land atmosphere interactions and persistence, actually constructing a persistence climatology for temperatures in the South Central United States. So this was part of a NOAA RESA project uh, in the Southern Climate Impacts, Impacts Planning Program. And what these maps show are month to month uh, autocorrelations of maximum temperatures. So trying to quantify the persistence of, of temperatures from month to month. And so anywhere you see colors that are shaded on here, we have statistically significant autocorrelations between monthly temperatures. And what I wanna highlight is, is here in the third row uh, that we see some of the highest autocorrelations during the summer months. And so we actually, because of thinking about the land atmosphere feedbacks with warm temperatures, see a stronger persistent signal during these warmer months. Uh, and if you raise the temperature even more, say a heat wave, uh, like we saw in the Midwest last week, um, the persistence of these extreme events is even more common uh, with warmer temperatures as well. Um, so this persistence isn't just limited to temperatures. 
uh, persistence of drought events is also common. And so uh, on the right here is for the South Central United States, again, uh, box plots that show different locations and the persistence of drought events using the standardized precipitation index. And so on the y-axis, you'll see uh, U.S. drought monitor categories ranging from D0 on the bottom, abnormally dry, to the worst exceptional drought, D4, on the top. And so for any given month that, that fell into this category with the 12th month SPI, what's the average time for that to last until recovery? And so we can see, not surprisingly, uh, as we increase the, the drought severity, there's a, a smooth linear increase in the length of that dry spell and time to recovery. Um, and we also know that, that things like seasonality and, and drought severity are gonna impact the length of droughts. Um, but this does help thinking about the predictions of drought. Um, a figure like this can help to think about what's the average recovery time based on the historical data, um, but ultimately, uh, persistence isn't as good of a, a forecasting technique for drought in some cases um, because of just thinking about, we're not thinking about just one variable like with temperature, um, but really the combination of temperature and precipitation and antecedent conditions that are needed to understand drought makes it a little bit more difficult to forecast. Um, and one thing we can do to help increase our understanding of this cycle and forecast of things like heat and drought if we can quantify the amount of water vapor storage at the land surface, that's very, very important. And so that's why measuring soil moisture uh, is, is so important for hydroclimatology and can provide a lot of benefits. Uh, soil moisture is an, kind of an essential climate variable because it's that link between the atmospheric and terrestrial components of the hydrologic cycle, again, typically more during the warm season. And so um, now I want to talk a little bit about uh, using soil moisture uh, with persistence to actually try and improve um, predictions even more across the United States. And so here I've got a map of uh, soil moisture sensor locations and network locations across the United States. Uh, this is from the National Soil Moisture Network or nationalsoilmoisture.com, which is hosted by my former research group at Ohio State University. Um, and I'm adding here this here because a lot of the data I'll show is from this network. Um, and I spent a lot of time as a PhD student, as a research assistant, uh, working in a large group to, to develop this network. And so um, looking now at an application uh, for this soil moisture data. And so the good thing is, is, is that when we look at this map, we see a lot of state and federal climate monitoring networks with soil moisture stations across the country. Uh, I think there's roughly uh, 2000 points displayed on this map. Uh, which is pretty good coverage of soil moisture. Um, and so this really shows that in the 21st century, we've seen a large scale increase in the availability of soil moisture data. We've seen a lot more effort to install these sensors across the country. Um, there's more satellite missions that are providing remote sensing soil moisture data and more evaluation of modeled soil moisture. And so with all of this data that, that's really come become available over the last 20 to 30 years, um, there's been little focus relatively on some of the agreement of efforts to integrate soil moisture in these predictions. So we know that it's an important variable because of the land atmosphere interactions, but how do we use soil moisture when there's so many choices for data um, in some of these forecast models? And so this is some of the motivation uh, for my dissertation research that, that really was an objective analysis quantifying how forecasts using different sources of soil moisture compared to baseline forecast skill. And so for a little bit more background, when we think about a forecast and constructing a forecast, we need to think about the data availability and data quality. This is especially true with soil moisture because unlike other variables like temperature and precipitation, as you saw on the map, the coverage is, is just not the same. Uh, it's maybe an order of magnitude less of the number of stations that are providing data. Uh, personally, I know uh, there's not as many stations in Missouri when we look at the map and at my former institution in Ohio. Now, we can also find some other places across the country, say Oklahoma, where you have great spatial coverage. And so we really have to think about that when making the forecast. Here, I've kind of included a subjective table that rates uh, some of the different types of soil moisture data we could use. Uh, so first, with the in-situ measurements, 
where we're actually installing a sensor in the soil uh, to make contact with that soil and measure the moisture. Uh, again, the spatial coverage relatively to, to other data sets and products is pretty poor. There, there's going to be areas where you're very far from the nearest soil moisture sensor. Um, do we get a measurement at all depths? This is another important question. It depends on the network, depends on the station, at what depths you might find. Uh, a lot of times th these might not be the same for different areas as well. Um, we also would like to have a lengthy period of record for that data. Um, but unfortunately with soil moisture, while we do have some stations that go back maybe a few decades and provide that historical period of record, some of these stations are very new and only have just a few years of historical data at this point. Um, and finally, we do want an accurate representation of ground truth. Uh, so the in situ is advantageous in that we're actually um, measuring the soil moisture, uh, not deriving it or, or calculating that soil moisture indirectly uh, in contrast. Uh, so in, in locations where we maybe don't have those in situ uh, sensors, we can rely on remote sensing soil moisture. So using satellite derived uh, measurements. The spatial coverage may be better and that we could get a nice gridded look at soil moisture across a region, um, but ultimately that's dependent on, on things like the orbital path of the satellite. So how many days between each observation and some of the coverage where if the satellite can't measure at the soil, it could inhibit that spatial coverage as well. Uh, satellites also can really only measure uh, the immediate land surface, so the topmost soil moisture, it, it can't penetrate to those deeper depths, so we're not getting all measurements. Um, similar to the in situ data, some of these remote sensing products might not have a long period of record, uh, depends how long the satellite was operating, and ultimately we're, we're deriving soil moisture from other measurements and getting a little bit farther from that ground truth as an in situ measurement. Uh, in, in many cases where remote sensing or in situ uh, kind of fails in spatial, spatial coverage or providing all of those depths, uh, models are great for historical data. They typically can go back a long time, calculate soil moisture at, at depths that are desired and provide some kind of uh, resolution and, and daily time steps. Um, but models uh, maybe have some bias. Uh, we're just parameterizing uh, the land surface to calculate that soil moisture. And so we do worry about the accuracy there. And I want to talk about this because um, each of these sources of soil moisture data, these are all widely used, but they all have distinct strengths and weaknesses that should be considered when applied, especially in some of these forecasting systems. So for example, we need adequate historical data um, to fit some type of statistical model to make a prediction or calibrating and forcing uh, more dynamic models that, or land surface models to make those predictions as well. Um, in some cases where we don't have any of this historical data, uh, there's also proxies for soil moisture. So maybe using some type of precipitation calculation as well. Um, but really few studies have examined how those forecast models might be sensitive to these different types of soil moisture data that are shown here. And so uh, the methods for, for this study uh, was to really utilize a pretty simple statistical forecast technique in quantile regression. Uh, and so these are really, really simple models, univariate regression models between soil moisture and temperature. Um, but the reason we chose kind of a simpler method is, is not that we're trying to create the most complex or accurate model. Uh, really, we want to just choose a, a pretty a simple to use model and focus more on the sensitivity to soil moisture data in some of the forecast output from that model. And so here what we did is, is we created statistical forecast of monthly temperatures using antecedent soil moisture as the independent variable at zero to two month lead times. Uh, so when I say lead times, a zero month lead time would mean that we use all available historical data from the previous month to forecast the next month's temperature. Uh, a one month lead time would, would be one month in advance and two months lead would be two months in advance. Uh, so really getting out to one season in advance on uh, these predictions. And so uh, by fitting a model here, uh, quantile regression, what we do is we actually calculate a simple linear regression at different quantiles of the dependent variable or temperature in this case. And so uh, this graph here on the, the left kind of shows this a little bit better in that we look at a linear regression fit between temperature and soil moisture across different portions of the temperature distribution. 
And so here we see in all cases a negative slope, which indicates an inverse relationship between soil moisture and temperature. So dry soils typically lead to warmer temperatures, wet soils typically lead to cooler temperatures. But when we get to the 95th quantile, where the absolute highest temperatures that we're, we're using to fit the model, we see a steeper negative slope in this case, indicating that that, that relationship between soil moisture and temperatures is actually stronger uh, with more extreme temperatures. And so what we can do is, uh, in many cases, we don't know what the next month's temperature is. Uh, so to create kind of a consensus forecast, uh, create a prediction based on each of these quantiles, uh, simplify that, that into more of a probabilistic approach. So uh, forecasting either below normal, normal, or above normal uh, temperatures, and then cho choosing what's the consensus forecast based on those quantiles to make a prediction. And so uh, here we show some box plots. Uh, this is for roughly 550 locations across the United States uh, that shows the distribution of forecast skill using this quantile regression forecasting framework. And so across the x-axis here on the bottom, we see each uh, soil moisture data set that was used in the model. Uh, so in situ at three different depths, uh, L1 or layer one is zero to 10 centimeters, L2 is 10 to 40, L3 is 40 to 100 centimeters. Uh, using the same depths, we also use model uh, derived soil moisture from the North American land data assimilation system land surface model as well as a proxy here as well. So uh, for cases where, where we might not have soil moisture, we calculated the three-month standardized precipitation index, or SPI, as a proxy using only precipitation data. And so there's not a lot of difference uh, between these box plots for the different data sets. I do want to point out uh, what the kind of skill is showing here. Uh, so on the y-axis, these are high-key high skill score values that attempt to calculate the forecast skill of the predictions uh, while also removing uh, artificial skill uh, due, due to uh, kind of random chance when we use this probabilistic framework as well. Uh, so that means that anything that's greater than zero, a skill score greater than zero, we're beating a climatology baseline. So this baseline would be 33.3% of the forecasts are correct, maybe because we're just guessing normal each time. Um, so all of these forecasts, most locations are skillful, uh, roughly, you know, the medium, median somewhere between 33 and 40 percent of forecasts. But what's interesting is there are some uh, locations we see here, uh, even some outlying locations where we can get up to 50 percent of those forecasts being uh, correct one month in advance uh, using the soil moisture in the quantile regression model. Um, so just looking at the forecast skill, we didn't see a lot of difference between data sets uh, for some of that skill. They were all skillful with minor differences. And so another way to kind of slice the data here uh, is these maps show for each lead time uh, which data source had the, the highest uh, forecast skill. So we can see our in situ, NLDES, and the different depths here. No preference would be um, that the, there were two data sets that were having equivalent skill in the, in the model. And so we ended up seeing that, um, not shown here, but, but there were significant differences just between the soil moisture observations and the data sets. Even the model parameters in some cases, such as the slope, were significantly different. Um, but as you can see here, and kind of the, the rainbow uh, smattering on the map, there's little evidence to suggest that models are sensitive to these types of soil moisture data because it's really difficult to pick out any kind of spatial pattern. We couldn't look at one region and, and show where maybe uh, the NLDS model was doing a little bit better compared to in situ. Um, some other notable results we found, it, it's kind of hard to see with the colors here, um, but for most locations, it was that topmost soil moisture that was most important. Uh, so zero to 10 or 10 to 40 centimeters was a little bit better with the prediction. That deeper soil moisture was, was rarely as important. Um, and then we do see some green on the map as well. There are locations where the SPI performed equivalently or better to soil moisture, and, and it can show promise as an effective proxy in, in those situations. Um, to me, I, I think one of the most interesting findings uh, from here uh, was really looking at so-called forecast of opportunity. And, and these forecasts of opportunity would be, where is it most critical to use soil moisture and show promise for improving the forecast the most. Um, to answer that question, we found that 
uh, really at the longer lead times, the one and two month leads, soil moisture pr provided the most value. And so what this table is showing here on the right is we actually constructed in parallel uh, a temperature, temperature persistence quantile regression forecast uh, where we used the previous month's temperature uh, to try and make a prediction. And this kind of improved, it set a higher baseline than a climatology forecast. Now we also wanna beat a persistence forecast here as well. And so um, this just shows different data sources and the percentage of locations across the US where soil moisture beat out a persistence forecast. And we can see at a zero month lead, uh, I was roughly 60% of forecast with an improvement using soil moisture but getting out to a two month or one season lead, uh, approximately 80% uh, locations had higher skill using soil moisture. So the utility of soil moisture uh, relative to persistence is actually increasing with increasing lead times and, and maybe points at circumstances where uh, it's most important to include in those forecasts there. And so this was a really interesting finding we thought uh, from, from looking at some of these models and how they performed. And so uh, I showed previously soil moisture being applied for some of these forecasts and really to quantify the land atmosphere interactions. And I don't want to leave out drought in this context because soil moisture is also critical for monitoring drought as a climate hazard and can also be used for, for drought predictions as well. Um, however, relative to, to predicting monthly temperatures, um, droughts a little bit maybe more complex. It's, it's one of the most complex natural hazards because it's difficult to quantify that drought severity depending on the type of data you're using and link and assess uh, drought severity classifications to their drought impacts. It's very difficult. There's a lot of research that goes into improving our linkages between drought severity and the impacts. Um, but we have to have some way to quantify drought severity. Just like this map shows here, uh, where we're using the United States Drought Monitor Classification System. Uh, we need these depictions of drought, not just operationally to look at the weekly drought map, um, but to look at, at historical climate analysis, future projections, risk assessments. We need to be able to divine when a drought ends, uh, starts, and, and be able to count the number of drought events, certain severities, um, to really understand some of these characteristics a lot better. And so that's why we use these classification systems. Uh, this table here is the, the United States Drought Monitor five category classification system. So you're probably familiar with this. It ranges from D0 abnormally dry to D4 exceptional drought. And here each column, we've got uh, some popular drought indices or indicators um, that, that have some more explicit thresholds to meet to enter one of those categories. And so here we can uh, directly kind of calculate drought frequency, severity, and duration using these thresholds. So this is kind of an operational definition of drought used by USDM. Uh, we see this frequently implemented in research and operations as uniform though, and that these thresholds are constant with time and space. So this means that we would use these thresholds to monitor drought in Missouri, uh, but also Florida, also California, uh, very diverse climates, but we're still relying on the same methods here. This would rely on the assumption that, that we can directly compare a drought index from one location to another, or that the probability of reaching these thresholds is equal. Um, but we know from previous research that several drought indices may not be spatially comparable uh, to meet this expectation of constant thresholds. And this isn't just uh, something with United, drought, uh, United States Drought Monitor. Uh, we also see a similar approach used in Europe, for example. This is the European Drought Observatory. Uh, looks a little bit different, um, but we're still using those constant thresholds here. Uh, so here we see three drought classifications using the SPI uh, for, for all of this region as well. So same thresholds um, used in Europe as in Northern Africa. Again, very diverse climates uh, that we're applying this system to. And so a research question that we previously looked at is, are these constant severity thresholds able to account for drought characteristics, which may be spatially variant? And so I just wanna briefly dive into the methods using this table. Uh, I'll, I'll try and kind of explain this uh, moving through e each column here, um, but this shows for each of the USDM categories, the standardized precipitation index or the standardized precipitation evapotranspiration index thresholds. Uh, so, so the nice thing about the SPI or SPEI is that they're pretty statistically elegant and we can directly interpret what these values mean. And so all of these values are essentially Z-scores in the historical distribution. 
So how many standard deviations are we uh, from the mean or what would be expected on, on rainfall here? And so if we were in exceptional drought, this is a uh, SPI value of negative two, that would be two standard deviations from the mean on the dry tail of the distribution. Uh, so on that side of the distribution, this is roughly 2.28% driest months in the historical record. Now, if we've got enough historical data, uh, the maps on the right, this is a prism precipitation data from 1900 to 2015. So over 116 years of data, we can actually calculate based on uh, what's theoretically expected based on the z-scores, the number of months we would expect to be in each drought category. And so you can see here, uh, this is the proportional difference in severity frequencies. If our observations were meeting what was theoretically expected, we'd see a lot of this white color, um, but we see a lot of blues and reds as well. Um, those are showing relatively under or overestimating those severity classifications. So where we see red, maybe we're seeing up to twice as many D3 or D4 as we would expect. Where we're seeing blue, we're seeing less. Uh, areas in West Texas, for example, on this map that had never seen uh, a D4 using the one month SPI during this time period. Why is this occurring? Uh, here's a couple distributions pulled from that PRISM data. This is not uh, distributions of precipitation data, but the index data itself. Uh, so we see here that uh, West Texas and El Paso, Texas, we overestimate the lower end severities and then underestimate uh, D3 and D4. Uh, on the, on the, the other side, we see Tyler, Texas, much wetter climate in East Texas, and it's kind of the reverse of this as well. So this is just one example of where the SPI, we fit a distribution of the precip, it should normalize the data, but in some cases it doesn't, and this can really impact uh, the drought conditions. Um, and so also just want to briefly show it's not just the spatial thing based on the historical climate, um, but also uh, drought frequencies can change from month to month as well. So we may see more or less than expected of a severity for a given month as well. Um, so this was some previous research. I want to show what we're working on now, and it's applying this method to more of a global scale outside of the South Central United States as well. I'm going to flip through these maps pretty, pretty quickly. I just want to show uh, global scale using three different precipitation data sets, still seeing a lot of blues and reds where we're under or overestimating uh, some of those drought severity frequencies. Um, it's not just the one month SPI as well, uh, longer time scales where maybe we eliminate some zeros in that data record, still seeing uh, disproportionate drought frequencies, uh, 12 month SPI is shown here as well. Um, also, uh, we even see this with the SPEI as well. So maybe it's not just a function of the precipitation data, but even in a multivariate distribution with temperature as well, lots of blues and reds on these maps uh, as well. Um, globally, do we, do we see any kind of spatial pattern based on the climate? Um, that's what these box plots show is, is we broke uh, each grid cell uh, globally into six different climate classifications ranging from arid to saturated. So when you look at these box plots, uh, this is the proportional D4 frequency, uh, less than expected in arid locations for all three uh, precipitation data sets, which aligns with what we saw with the PRISM data in far west Texas as well. Um, and so if we, we were to look at an, an average distribution for any of these climate types, I just put these out here to show uh, when you look at your distribution characteristics like skewness or, or kurtosis, the variance relative to the mean, Blue and red really, really stick out here, uh, significantly different from other climate types. So in these arid and saturated climates with more extreme precip characteristics, this is where uh, drought frequencies aren't meeting the theoretical expectation most. Um, and so uh, quickly, we've also talked about, well, what do we do once we identify these areas of disproportionate frequencies? And so I've discussed objective drought thresholds that are spatially variant depend only on a historical uh, climate and the, the data at a historical location, um, does this help? So if we allow those thresholds to vary a little bit by, with space, um, can we see a better classification of drought? And so um, these are global histograms of the objective thresholds. And I just wanna show how they vary from the original USDM thresholds on the, the Y axis here. So in some locations, uh, the D4 becomes more extreme to account for seeing more than expected D4 or less extreme to account for seeing less than expected. Um, and so these objective thresholds 
We can also look at the difference between that and the original USDM threshold and, and propose this as a way to quantify potential classification bias. And so this would just be kind of a proof of concept with the one month SPI, really focus on the, the Southwest United States. That dark blue uh, would be a less severe, especially D4 threshold, so that we meet that D4 uh, more in line with the expectations of, of that fixed classification system by the USDM. And so what does all this mean? Um, this is a brief case study from uh, Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas during the 2011 drought. Uh, we can look at the proportion of area in drought for each severity category using three sets of th uh, thresholds. So the red line is going to be the subjective or constant thresholds. Uh, the blue is going to be the objective thresholds. Purple's also letting those thresholds vary by month, so monthly objective. Doesn't look like a big difference uh, just looking at these line graphs, but if we zoom in, uh, for, for example here, uh, looking at D4, the objective thresholds by, by making that index less severe, we picked up more of the D4 frequencies. Again, this looks like a small difference, but this was roughly 75,000 square kilometers roughly three counties maybe in, in Texas that might have been reclassified as D4 during this three-month window. So it gives you a little bit different picture of what drought may have looked like. Um, I want to briefly uh, also talk about some of the, the research to operations here. Um, we've worked a bit with the National Drought Mitigation Center on some of this research, presented it at the U.S. Drought Monitor Forum, um, and, and brought some of this into the classroom as well. So last fall, I taught a new class on, on drought at Ohio State University, um, actually gave some students some drought data to look at, and, and we really tried to look at things uh, and, and see how often these droughts were occurring. One group looked at Ohio, for example, and, and was finding really a lack of D4 there as well. So um, there's really a lot of opportunities for some operational uh, engagement as well with this research. Um, I show all of this because a critical evaluation of bias is essential given that a lot of these thresholds are used in mitigation and response. So if we miss it just a little bit, that could have large impact. So hopefully this method can provide better information to, for, to inform drought monitoring activities, not replacing expert judgment, uh, you know, not looking at every index, but just to complement it and support it by providing severity thresholds that are a little different, objectively formulated, and, and can maybe show uh, bias or uncertainty that, that can occur with the classification. Um, some future research is to also look at how these things are, are changing with time. So if our distribution of a drought index is changing from 1901 to 1940 to the current 40 years, is that threshold changing as well? Uh, if not, it's possible to over or under, underestimate events based on an earlier period of record. Uh, so we've shown, for example, uh, two global precipitation data sets have shown that the D4 index globally averaged is actually becoming more extreme uh, with time. And so if those thresholds aren't, are, aren't moving as well, we could see some temporal bias as well. Um, and so finally, uh, to, to wrap up my drought research, uncertainties in drought monitoring arise for many reasons. We talk about things like methods used to calculate indices or parameterize variables, different input data sets how indices are applied relative to different types of droughts. These are all things that are discussed quite a bit in the scientific community. There's less discussion on how the, the severity thresholds themselves might contribute to uncertainty in drought monitoring. And so uh, this is a, a fairly new result. I want to acknowledge that, that the current work is being funded by NSF, um, but this is the largest source of D4 classification bias. Uh, was it spatial and that the thresholds didn't represent the local climate, temporal, and that the changes in drought characteristics are moving so fast that it introduces a temporal bias, uh, or is it just a difference between the three data set biases? We found overwhelmingly 98% uh, of the, the, the locations, it was either the spatial or temporal bias, but in, in 95, it was the temporal bias. So uh, really important relative to that data bias that's been acknowledged. Um, so in the future, I, I wanna continue working on this research. Uh, because I pull up some studies here where we look at trends and, and things in drought, and a lot of them use some kind of constant threshold system. So here on the left, uh, we, we use this drought classification scheme. Here we have categories which would have thresholds as, associated with them. And so if we were looking at a time series that's relying on those thresholds, 
What if there was a bit of a confidence interval surrounding that that communicated some of that uncertainty as it relates to those thresholds? Um, and so I think here in Missouri and, and working with the Missouri Climate Center and in extension, I think there's opportunities to look at incorporating this uncertainty into some of the, the drought relief and mitigation. Um, so here, uh, these, uh, these figures are from earlier this year, uh, but it's USDA, uh, some of the uh, assistance that's gone out through the Livestock Forage Program, especially. Um, and so we can see that there was a lot in 2022. Uh, this is estimated. I think some of those claims are still coming in. Um, and we'll see quite a bit in 2023 with the current drought as well. Um, but the table to receive these relief payments, we see uh, D2, D3, D4 uh, meeting these a certain amount of weeks to get those payments. But what if the, the probability of reaching each of these intensities is not equal spatially? What if it's different depending on where you live? Well, that means your probability of, of receiving this, this mitigation relief also varies. And so that's why it's pretty important to, I think, to think about the uncertainty and how it can incorporate into some of these drought recovery efforts as well. Um, and so also it could help to maybe link to, to Missouri impacts. So uh, a lot of times we'll look at the map and then uh, the impacts can vary so much across the, uh, the state. And so here I show uh, the state drought impacts for Missouri and, and how can that uncertainty better link the impacts to what we're seeing with an index like the SPI, for example. Uh, this is something I, I definitely hope to work on. Uh, also, I, I want to look more into flash drought in the future as well. These two maps show how flash, flash drought prone the Midwest and Missouri can be. Uh, so on the left, I have a five class change in the U.S. drought monitor from July 4th uh, going back to, to May 30th. And we saw how quickly that drought onset was across Missouri and a lot of the upper Midwest. Uh, in some, some locations, changing four classes in, in five weeks. This will quantify as a, as a, or qualify as a flash drought. Um, but it's not just this year. In Missouri, at least, we saw the southern part of the state go through almost an identical situation with a multiple class degradation uh, in the late summer last year as well. So clearly vulnerable to these flash droughts. Uh, they really occur quickly due to intense la land atmosphere and vegetation feedbacks. Uh, so how can things like improved observation systems of soil moisture and ET help to better understand these interactions during flash drought. Uh, this could be high impact research for the, the region as well. Um, fortunately here at the University of Missouri within the School of Natural Resources, there's a global climate change group that's doing great job actually uh, challenging students and faculty to, to actually make seasonal forecasts and, and put those out publicly. Um, so I look forward to working with them more in the future, maybe doing things like combining soil moisture with teleconnections for an optimal forecast. Uh, and maybe try and uh, put some forecasts out in real time and, and replicate some more uh, operational forecasts like that are done by the Climate Prediction Center. Um, and finally, working in extension, I'm really seeking to look for additional opportunities to expand my research interest, uh, work on collaborative contracts, and, and really build tools with, with climate data um, to get this out to, to more users. Um, and so here on the right, this is uh, the Ohio precipitation tool I was working at uh, on at Ohio State with a group, uh, including Aaron Wilson, the Ohio State climatologist. Uh, we were working on this last year to really update uh, precipitation frequency updates from the old NOAA Atlas 14. And so this was developed into a tool uh, where users can actually uh, look at the period of record to see how it might change uh, some of these return periods. And, and this kind of information is, is so crucial to make the data more accessible um, and to, to get it out to users such as the Franklin Soil and Water Conservation uh, District. So um, some of this has been done in Missouri. Uh, so we have our Missouri Mesonet here with tools such as our temper, temperature inversion risk uh, tracker that, that's used a lot, especially thinking about fertilizer applications. Uh, we also have uh, design storm alert systems. So when we're exceeding a return period like we have in early August um, to get out an automated alert through email. Um, but I, I wanna look for more research to operations tools such as these, and maybe even create some local drought and experimental analysis tools in collaboration with other state climate offices in the region. And so uh, with that, I'm gonna end here. Um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to, to talk about my research. Um, I also included some boxes in gold here. 
Um, so these, this is the mission of the Missouri Climate Center. And I just wanted to put this because I think uh, it overlaps my research well, and I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Um, so goals of the Missouri Climate Center, develop advanced databases with atmospheric conditions, climate variations, and ecosystem changes in the state of Missouri, but also produce value-added products from the mesonet uh, with weather data and, and disseminate that product to statewide unit users. So um, having fun with, with, with combining that atmospheric and terrestrial data and figuring out innovative tools to, to get out there. Um, and then more application goals, monitor and document climate change, and also apply this to really look at effects on re regional atmospheric environment and ecosystem responses as well, and really thinking about drought and climate prediction. Um, so I'll, I'll end here and hopefully we have some time for questions. Thanks again for the invite to talk. Um, I've also included my contact information, so uh, feel free to get a hold of me that way as well. So thanks for your attention. All right, thank you, Zach. Interesting presentation. And the first question that popped up kind of got answered in the chat, but I'm gonna go ahead and ask you the question and get your interpretation. What is the difference between soil moisture and water table level? That's a that's a really good question. Um, so they are gonna be measuring different things. And I'll first say that um, in a lot of locations, soil moisture is measured at, at different depths. And uh, so you, you could, I guess, in some locations with a shallow water table, uh, be measuring soil moisture deep enough to, to reach that, that table. But typically, um, we're, we're measuring soil moisture in what's called the unsaturated zone of soil above the water table. Now, when we get deep enough uh, below a location, depends on where you're at, you actually hit the water table. And that's where you get to a, a level of the soil or, or um, kind of looking at some of the bedrock uh, that's totally saturated with water, meaning every pore or space is completely filled with water. Um, so this is where you would you would want to um, install a well down to this level to access that groundwater. Um, but soil moisture is in that unsaturated zone that's not permanently saturated. And so it reflects the climate more. So we're going to see things uh, like soil moisture declining due to evaporation, soil moisture recharging, through infiltration from rainfall, rainfall, and it gives us more of a, a, a measure of relative wetness or dryness. The level of the water table is going to be a little bit slower to respond, um, but that could also be used if it's uh, decreasing. If the water table is farther below ground, it's dry, um, but closer, a little bit wet. So two different variables, both very important, I think, in hydroclimatology and drought monitoring. All right. We do have a poll open right now, so if you haven't filled that out, go ahead and do that in the next few minutes. Steve's got a question he's posted publicly. Is the lagged influence of soil moisture on temperature stronger when soils are wet or when soils are dry? That's a great question, and um, that's not something uh, I looked at in this research that I could um, point, point to a result or, or data to, to show, um, but ultimately, I would say the answer to that question is probably going to vary depending on, on where you're at. Uh, so are, are you in uh, a very dry location that's a moisture limited climate regime? So you're only, get evapo only getting evapotranspiration occurring when there's rainfall or is it an energy limited? So somewhere like Ohio that, that's pretty wet. And so uh, the amount of evapotranspiration is, is really just dependent on the amount of energy that's available to move that water or are you somewhere in between and the transitional zone. Um, I think it would matter matter there. I think uh, in in wetter or I'm sorry, in drier locations, um, wet soils might have a, a stronger linkage to those land atmosphere interactions because that's when your ET is occurring. Um, and then in, in wetter locations, dry soils are probably closer linked um, because now you're limiting the ET and actually changing it. Um, not just based on the energy. So um, kind of a complicated answer, but I, I'll finish by saying that I think some of the research I have looked at everywhere across the U U.S., we did see that that soil moisture was able to uh, skillfully, moderate skill at best, but skillfully predict those temperatures. Okay, I got a direct message on this one. Uh, let's say we take a bunch of farmers and we have them put soil moisture sensors in their fields or along their field borders, would that data be useful or, or would it be skewed due to the managed nature of that land? 
That's a that's a really good question. And I will never uh, not advocate for more soil moisture th th data. There's always going to be some value to that data. Um, but we would have to think about some of the limitations with, with just uh, letting a lot of soil moisture sensors get out into the field. Um, because at that point, um, without a long historical period of record, <laughs> excuse me, um, we don't, we aren't able to standardize that soil moisture. And so if you were to put those soil moisture sensors in different fields, you might see some, some differences in the moisture across these fields, but that could be due to things like the soil texture being different. What's that soil made of? Uh, maybe there's some topographical differ differences as well. Now, where that information would become more helpful is if we put those sensors into a field and left them for five years. And then we had some historical data and we could look at how wet or dry are, the, are those soils relative to our climatological normal on that day. Uh, and so then it would be easier to compare these locations looking at things like anomalies or percentiles uh, that are doing less to monitor the soil characteristics and more uh, climate information from those soils. Uh, so a good period of record uh, would, would help out with those sensors a lot. Okay, so the next question has a preface. Um, basically, the thought is that regenerative ag practices and implementing those can help make more resilient farms. Could we quantify that using soil cover improved infiltration and water holding capacity, which could theoretically reduce evapotranspiration? Yeah, that's that's an interesting question. And I, I think there would be a, a, a lot of desire with more soil moisture sensors to look at research like this. And I, I think it could be done. It, it you know, would really require a, soil moisture data at a pretty fine scale. Um, but if you were able to, to collect that data across maybe similar weather conditions, um, but different management practices uh, to see how different cover crops are, are protecting that water from ET, uh, maybe slowing down the ET, um, that'd be really useful. And then to be able to, to plug that information and to, to better model some of the, the ET and crop relations uh, would be great because then eventually you, you could have an answer and provide uh, a, a good quantitative estimate of how much these uh, regenerative practices are actually helping make maybe more drought resilient or, or less prone to ET. Um, so I, I think that there's a, a big appetite for kind of field scale research questions like that. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and shut down the poll here in 30 seconds. So if you haven't filled that out, go ahead and do that. The next question we've got is theoretically a yes or no question. Did you ever use SMAP in your research? Great question. Um, I, I've worked with SMAP data in the past. So for those who don't know, um, this is the NASA SMAP satellite mission uh, started in 2015 and is still providing uh, daily soil moisture uh, uh, for, for the whole globe, but, but the U.S. as well. Um, and I didn't use it for this research because uh, SMAP doesn't provide soil moisture uh, every day in the same location. It takes roughly three to four days to, to map the whole U.S., depending on the, the orbit of the satellite. Um, so it, it was going to be tricky to use that in the forecast models with the in situ and the model data that we had an observation every day. So it was a bit limited and I wanted to consider remote sensing, but didn't use the SMAP data. Okay, we'll end on this question. And uh, certainly you've got Zach's information if you wanna ask him anything else via email or otherwise. How much of the variation over a state is stable over time? And the, the example question is, does a certain county get more droughts than other areas? That's that's a good question. I'm, I'm gonna go to my slides here and I, I wish I had uh, an example to show in Missouri, but I'll, I'll go to our friends in the South Central US here. Um, and the answer is yes, with, with some indices that you're going to see differences in trends. And so, you know, when when we're looking at drought monitoring, we don't want to rely on just one index. But if you were looking at the one month SPI, for, for example, one month precipitation 
uh, is it relatively wet or dry? And you were to look at Texas, you would find uh, a lot more high end drought events in East Texas uh, versus West Texas. And is that a product of the climate or is it a product of the data set that that we're using here here we think it's a limitation with the spi we think really with the one month spi there were zeros in some months it kind of made a, a funky fit when calculating the spi and as a result it's not capturing some of the high-end drought so it's really obscuring like a county to county trend and so that's why if we had maybe some thresholds or uncertainty it'd be a little bit easier to compare uh, across two different counties and 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 look at those trends that way. Okay. Well, we've come to the top of the next hour. I appreciate you, Zach, for taking the time to be with us today. I appreciate all of you that are, are still with us. And stay tuned. In a couple months, we're going to have another one of these. We don't know exactly who the speaker is yet, but uh, we've got somebody in mind. And if it is who I think it's going to be, you're going to want to be here. So have a great day.